Merci, Eric. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, and this is where my French stops, unfortunately, so sorry for that. With our flavor chemistry program at the Australian Wine Research Institute, we try to understand the difference between good wine and great wine. We try to understand the, the basic molecules that make wine complex or that make certain wines unique and, and very special. And obviously, to, to capture the value of that type of research, we are also working very closely with, with the wine producers in Australia to translate that knowledge into um, production techniques or changes to production processes with a view really of having a lot of flexibility um, available to, to grape growers and, and winemakers to deal with a changing climate, to change with um, differences between vintages, but also to be able to, to respond to market and customer demands. Now, the story I'm sharing with you today started some 10 years ago when we tried to characterize the flavor compounds behind a cool climate Australian Shiraz. And you might think, well, Shiraz comes from the Rhone Valley out of France, and France obviously is by far the leading producing country around the world. So how comes that Australia works on Shiraz? and particularly on cool climate Shiraz. Cool climate in Australia is a bit of an oxymoron, I guess, for, for most of us. It was for me when I came over from Germany. Now, okay, <clears throat> what's special about Australian Shiraz? It's, it's a very important variety for us, for us as an industry. Um, this year, the total crush was just under 380,000 tons. So in an Australian context, that's 45% of all red grapes crushed or 23% of total wine production. So it's really big for grape growers, for wine industry. It creates a lot of value, about $1.8 billion in the last financial year from both the export and, and domestic market. Another aspect that's really special for Australian Syrah or the Shiraz is that it arrived actually about 170 years ago with, with a guy called Busby. Um, and because most of our growing regions never experienced phylloxera, we have very, very old planting material, very good low-yielding planting material, predominantly from France. And we have vineyards that are between 120 and 165 years old in the Barossa Valley, in Hunter Valley, which are still in production. So we're quite uniquely positioned to make well, unique products out of Shiraz, if you want. And obviously, talking Shiraz, all countries have the opportunity to tap into a big diversity of styles. As a straight varietal, we can consider blends, Shiraz with Cabernet Sauvignon, with what we call a GSM in Australia, Grenache or Granache with Shiraz and Mouvedre. Um, Coal ferments, for instance, with Viognier are currently popular by some producers. We make a sparkling Shiraz. Yes, it's bubbly and red, uh, mainly for the Australian market. Um, and there are many different regional styles that reflect uh, our terroir and microclimates. Just to make the point, I've brought with me a, a map of Australia. Um, and some of the cool climate regions you see on are in, in those reddish circles. So that was actually vineyards and producers you work with. To give you a bit of an idea about how big the place, how big the country is, we are based in Adelaide, down here in the middle. Um, if this would be Toulouse, Paris would be here in Melbourne. Okay. Um, so we have about 4,000 kilometers coastline. We have now got 65 uh, recognized grape growing areas that range from Western Australia, well, nothing growing here, lack of water, uh, to the south coast and up to the east coast. So there's a lot of diversity in terms of regions, in terms of soils, in terms of climates we can tap into. Let's move on. Cool climate styles, one of our key producers, Cape Mantel here in Western Australia. So that's three hours in a plane west of Adelaide. Um, here we have cool maritime climates. Moving on towards the east coast. Is out, huh? okay. <clears throat> Closer to Adelaide in, in a region called Kunawara. 
I'm um, here, producer Vince Kunawara Estate, one of our oldest producers. If you think Australia is hot, these guys had frost two weeks ago, okay, in their vineyards, and they are only 40 kilometers away from the sea. Okay, more cool climate producers close to our national capital, here at Clona Killer, uh, close to Canberra, Mount Langi in the Grampians. Some of us shared a bottle of that last night, and finally close to home, to Adelaide. Oops, too fast. I will work on my trigger figure. Um, Adelaide Hills. So that's only 10 kilometers out of town. It's high altitude viticulture for us between 450 to 700 meters uh, above uh, sea level. What is special for many of those cool climate Shiraz we have in Australia is that they come with a spicy black pepper aroma, which was seen actually as a desirable aspect by many of our winemakers. People, winemakers, wine writers, customers, use different descriptors re ranging from peppery, white pepper, spicy, herbaceous. It's predominantly seen as a flavor in Shiraz linked to cold climate. From an industry perspective, from a research perspective, from a management perspective, we see a lot of variation between vineyards and seasons, and I will add also lots of variation between individuals, between customers. When we started our research into the molecules, into the principles behind cool climate, Shiraz flavor, no peppery impact aroma was known. And if I say no compound was known, I'm talking about wine, but I'm also talking about pepper as a spice, which came kind of as a surprise to us. Now, we started off sampling grapes from a number of cool climate vineyards over two years. So those so wet dead points are the results from a quantitative descriptive sensory analysis of grape homogenates using a panel. Um, and you quite clearly see that, for instance, pepper aroma was correlated with pepper flavor, which was good. We were talking, looking for one principle. We were working with volatile compounds. Um, pepper was kind of independent of a lot of other flavors, whether it was green, grassy, apple flavors. So we were looking for something distinct. You're not just looking at unripe grapes, which helps. Um, it was a stable compound, and there were lots of differences between our panel members. Now, this little slide summarizes three years of work. We prepared uh, flavor extracts out of our grapes, separated so flavor compounds with gas chromatography, and then tried to detect the peppery principle. However, we found many compounds, none of those. We knew none of the compounds we could detect had a mass spectrum, had a name, which was kind of unexpected. So at the end, we really looked at an area in the chromatogram pretty late um, where no signal basically was detectable. And, and Tracy, who is with us, and the sm small number of our team players said, this is where all the spice comes of the colorment. Um, we spend another year and a half optimizing our analytical technique simply guided by our noses until we had the mass spectrum, which is kind of a fingerprint of the compound, and it told us, yes, it's a sesquiterpene. There are only some 300 sesquiterpenes around. So another couple of months down, we could give it a name. It was a compound, unfortunately, previously described before in the name of Rotundo. It's been found in a wheat, Cyprus Rotundo, therefore so funny specific name, trigger finger. Identity was confirmed with an authentic reference compounds for those analytical chemists in the audience. We now use multidimensional gas chromatography to quantify the compound with the help of an isotope label standards and established indeed it's a single compound from grapes goes into wine is stable, which is the key principle behind peppery aromas in grapes and wine. How potent is this compound? Threshold studies uh, established that the threshold in water sits at a low 8 nanograms per liter, so that's about 100,000 times lower than most of the esters we would see in wine. If we add it to red wine, the average threshold was 16 nanograms per liter, so it's, it's quite powerful. Another interesting observation was that out of a panel of 47, about 20 Five percent, a quarter of our staff couldn't actually perceive that compound are anosmic, which makes for interesting discussions. Now, closer look at the sensory data. Here we see a bar chart. Um, 
we have plotted basically concentration between 0.4 nanograms up to 4,000 nanograms versus those individuals who could uh, correctly describe the flavor. We had two super noses, super, not really tasters, but uh, super human detectors on our panel who could pick up at 0.4 nanogram per liter set compound quite reliably. Another group of six at 3.2, um, a much larger group at concentrations between 9.4 and 28 nanograms. A few had difficulties picking it at 250 to 700 nanograms, and nine failed. I couldn't, well, it was not a failure. They can't really do anything about it, but they couldn't detect it at concentrations above 4,000. So I guess the story is if Eric and I have a chat about whether cis Shiraz is peppery or not, and we disagree, it may simply be that both of us actually perceive the same product in, in a very different manner. And as a little side aspect here, rotundon is also the key peppery compound in, in pepper. And most of you would know that the waiter in a restaurant offers you the pepper at the table. And we believe it simply reflects the observation that, again, the cook and the client in a restaurant might not exactly share the same ability to, to um, detect or perceive pepperiness, spiciness. Okay, finally on our story, how potent is this compound? We, we looked at a reconstitution of model for Shiraz flavor. So it's a model that has 42 volatiles in it, uh, plus a number of non-volatiles. And what we did basically is we had some model with and without rotundon using concentrations about twofold the sensory threshold, 38 nanograms. And it's quite clear that in the instance where we removed <coughs> so a single compound out of the model is that the peppery descriptor was uh, significantly rated lower, and really the only other flavor affected at those low concentrations was um, geranium flavors. So yes, indeed, it's, it's a very important compound. It's a very potent compound, and individuals respond differently to it. Now, let's take a look at what influences rotundon levels. And to start this, we did a survey of commercial wines that were available at the time to us in the Australian market. So what you see here is a large group of Shiraz wines <coughs> um, from a number of regions, cool climate regions like Adelaide Hills, just making it to threshold, Clarendon, um, twice the threshold, a region, Grampians, pretty high up to 160 nanograms. <coughs> But we also found traces of rotundon in, in other red varietals, particularly Graciano and the Australian Durif. Now, more recently, we added a few more Shiraz samples, first of all. And you see, again, the wide range of, of pepperiness in cool climate Shiraz. Adelaide Hills between close to nothing, 7 nanograms, to just above 100. Um, here is the Canberra, Canberra district. Sorry, I'm getting told off by my colleagues if it's not Canberra. Um, up to 120 nanograms, Great Southern, that's West Australia, up to 40 nanograms. We are working currently with uh, Cheryl Logan from Auckland University looking at some uh, New Zealand Shiraz, um, which again has a wide range of pepperiness and rotundin in their premium products, ranging from 40 up to 240 nanograms. So Damn, the Kiwis have beaten us again. But uh, we also find it in the Duras wine produced here in, in Gayak at concentrations of around 40 nanograms in, in, a, in a high pepper year. Okay, more data, very recent data on some of your local wines from the recent project. The Graciano, lowish concentration at around threshold. The Gamay is the same story. Pinot Doni. Personally, I have no previous uh, experience with it. They're told it's grown in the Loire Valley. Um, it's very peppery, and as you can see from the data, it's fully supported. Um, and in Dera, we see actually distinctive seasonal effects. O12 this year, quite low. While last year, actually, some of your experimental ferments peaked out just above 40 nanograms per liter. I've also added this plot from Olivier just to show you about how and when this compound is formed. It's basically formed during ripening very close to commercial harvest. And that's the same story for Duras, where it's effectively formed around or just prior to commercial harvest and is stable after that to a large degree. But it's also the same story in Shiraz. Here we're looking on the left-hand plot at the 
two different clones. We're looking at Adelaide Hills fruit, same vineyard, same vintage. It's formed either at harvest in grapes or within a two weeks um, window, time window prior to harvest. Similar stories out of New Zealand, Hoax Bay, Syrah, two different producers. It's either formed immediately at harvest or within two to four weeks prior to harvest. But certainly in Shiraz, we see its formation between mid horizon and, and closer to harvest. Moving on to where actually is it in Shiraz? It's exclusively located in the skins, irrespective of uh, what clone you look at, and that's not just the case for Australian Shiraz, that's also supported by recent findings from the Italian research group in San Michele di Ladice. Now, finishing off our story on grapes here, we're looking at five different vineyards over two vintages, and what we have plotted here is the concentration of rotundon in grapes, those are the bars, versus the sensory rating for pepperiness of those grapes as perceived by, by our panel. And you quite clearly see that there's a really good correlation with the highest pepper rotundum grapes being the rated, rated, the, rated the highest in, in pepperiness as well. Also, if we would sort those data according to years, so basically look at the red bars, so that's the year 2003, which was relatively warm, versus 202, so those are the blue data points. You again see that there's distinctive, there are lots of distinctive seasonal effects with cooler vintages giving grapes with distinctively, significantly higher um, rotundum concentrations and obviously distinctively higher pepperiness that can be rated actually on the grapes. Moving on from the vineyard to the winery, rotundum extraction from berries during winemaking. Again, we are looking here at the two different clones, Adelaide Hills fruit um, and just extraction profiles. Point is, um, in the must after crushing, we find very low concentrations of around 10 to 12 nanograms per liter. Then as alcoholic fermentation progresses, uh, we see a linear increase in rotundum concentrations in those wines. Interesting enough, the concentration actually plateaus out well before pressing, which is here identified in the, the red circle. So we seem to achieve in wine an equilibrium of sorts or full extraction curious out whether we can extract the compound fully or whether we find backbinding to mark and, and solid components. Um, but certainly it's extracted during winemaking and our speculation right now is that's the way how you treat your grapes, uh, how you manage your cap, how you pump over, that all of that may contribute to concentrations of the peppery compound in the final wine. Just a brief snapshot, we haven't done really much work on yeast effects and pepperiness or rotundum concentrations. That's just data from a preliminary screen in a model system that was artificially enriched in rotundum, much higher concentrations. None of the five Cerevisia strain we selected showed really any notable effect. There was, however, a Bayana strain, AWI 1375, which showed some 30% decrease in the concentration of the peppery compound. Having said that, uh, for those who, who work with yeast quite regularly, Bayanus yeast, that strain actually is also a known slow fermenter. So we had here increased fermentation time, almost increased by 50%. And we're not quite sure whether this is a single observation from a case study or whether it holds up and whether it indicates that Bayanus can metabolize rotundon away, does actively something with it to remove it, or whether we simply see an effect where it binds to biomass and is um, removed with the lease. So I guess more work would be needed in that field. Um, data on stability, uh, a shelf life study looking at various closures from cork over synthetics to screw caps, data points three months, six months, uh, compared to a glass ampule, that's the right hand bar, no effect. So the compound, once you've got it in wine, is very stable and doesn't appear to interact uh, significantly with most of our closures. Now, um, just to come to the end, a few data on variability in Shiraz. Variability in pepperiness, variability in uh, rotundon across vineyards and vintages. Here we are looking at a vertical series of super premium Australian um, Shiraz Viognier, 
only got five to ten percent Viognier in it, but so be it. Uh, with wines made between 97 to 2008, and again in the same winery by the same winemaker in a very consistent style. And what you clearly can see is for the same winery, it's a small producer's range of pepperiness and rotundon goes from 20 nanograms up to 140 nanograms. So there's a wide range, there is a lot of response to seasonal growing conditions. And this was not the case for this district, for this one individual growers. In blue, another winery or a number of other wineries, again, the pattern seems to be we either have high pepper years or we have low pepper years, irrespective. Uh, and that applies to um, the region, but is independent of the winery. Um, more on variability, here we are looking at what effectively was supposed to be a precision viticulture experiment. One relatively large vineyard in Western Australia divided in six zones according to uniform soil properties and uniform vigor. What we have plotted here is the Rotundon data for those six zones. Um, for three grape replicates. And you see that uh, A, there's quite a variability in, in medium um, rotundum concentrations across this one vineyard, again from 10 nanograms per kilogram up to some 40. But you also see a lot of variability even within one zone, which was considered very uniform by other established measures such as EM38 surveys or, or vigor ratings. And that's data that are very young. It's from this growing season, and I think the numbers only left the cheesy mass back about two weeks ago. Here we're looking at the two hectare blocks in the Grampians. Um, and what we have in this experiment, we have got 177 grape wines that are individually georeferenced, and we have sampled uh, berries from all those grape wines and uh, quantified the compound uh, rotundon, and are now able basically to create, if you want, a vineyard map. And what I'm showing you is just my interpretation of the data on the plane. You can do much more sophisticated analysis using k-means clustering if you want, but what we clearly see is that there is a a zone in this vineyard where we see very low concentrations, around 70 to 200 nanograms, and this basically is all that purple patch along that driveway. And then there are a couple of other wines, basically, that are more on the southeastern side of the block with the red dots, where we see on individual wines the rotundum concentrations that are sitting between 800 to 1,000 nanograms per kilogram. Um, Pen Shi Tseng, who is a PhD student, now tries to understand the factors that are causing that vineyard variability. And we also try to understand bunch-to-bunch uh, -bunch variation versus wine-to-wine -wine variation and compare that to uh, between-side variation. So just to finish off, um, a single compound, red rotundone, it's a sesquit... No, that wasn't me is uh, responsible for peppery aromas, in, uh, certainly in Shiraz, in cool climate Syrah, but also in Dura, in, in a number of other varieties. Your site, your location of your vineyard and the vintage are key to the concentration found in grape and wine. And we also see significant wine-to-wine -wine variation, even in uniform sites, which makes actually research into viticultural practices for, for this sensory character quite difficult to undertake. If we stay on Shiraz, what can we do in viticulture? Well, so one thing that stands out that I would say is robust and established, observed by many researchers in at least three different countries is ripening is a key factor uh, to the formation of peppery um, flavors and to the formation of the sesquiterpene. Shara Logan right now at Uni Auckland is finishing off his PhD study where he looks actually at clone vigor, leaf removal and crop load. So that information should become public in the very near future. In Dura, again, ripening is a key factor, and from the preliminary data Olivier shared with us last week, it looks like that uh, in at least this growing season, irrigation, illicit treatment, or crop thinning led to slightly increased rotundum levels in, in Dura's grapes. Uh, control was kind of sitting in the middle and leaf removal led to um, reduced levels. 
finishing off, there are only limited options available to us currently to manage uh, or to lower rotundon levels and to manage pepper aroma in the winery, big question mark behind yeast. We looked at skin contact and cap extraction, but uh, so far with not much su success. For instance, uh, in the 2012 uh, vintage, we, we looked at a machine-picked fruit that was crushed, destemmed, and open-fermented, and we compared that fruit or rotundum concentrations in those wines with uh, rotundum concentrations in where the same fruit was uh, hand-picked and whole bunch open-fermented, and there were no significant differences or no differences in it. So. We still have to do a lot of learning when it comes to cap management and extraction and whether we can influence pepperiness that way. That leaves us with the question, how can we manage our vineyards to either increase or decrease rotundin in fruit, or perhaps we just need to reduce variability and be able to deal with um, climate effects more in a better informed way. Scientifically, it's quite interesting that Shiraz and Dura are actually genetically very, very different grape wine varieties. Although they make the same compounds, they seem to share a lot of the biosynthetic pathways uh, that lead to rotundin and pepperness. So one of the questions we ask, we can't answer at this point in time, is uh, what is special about the grape wine genome? What are the common features between Shiraz and Dura? What are the environmental factors that cause high rotundin in some wines and in some seasons? And finally, is there a biological fact function or what biological function does rotundin serve? Because it's hard to believe that it's made by nature just to give us the impression that wine is peppery or, or not. Coming to an end, acknowledgments. This work would not have been possible without many Australian wine industry collaborators who have supported us over the last 10 years. It would not have been possible with collaborations with partners in Germany, France more recently, and uh, Auckland University in New Zealand. Um, it would not have been possible with having a very dedicated team at AWRI who actually never gave up identifying that compound while we couldn't detect it on any mass spectrum for a couple of years. And it would not have been possible without funding, which in Australia comes from the Grape and Wine Research and Development Corporation. Merci bien. Thanks for inviting me to share this story with you.